Thank you, uh, Dr. Perry. I will send the check to you uh, later on today. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to Westminster College and one of the most spectacular events that anyone could see is about to happen. I hope it happens that we see everything in the detail we would like. You never know. Experiments can go awry. But I hope it'll work out for all of us. I'd like to start out by asking uh, people uh, to raise their hand if you have ever seen a lunar eclipse. That is, with the sun hidden, or I'm sorry, the moon hidden by the earth. Okay. Something like that. It's spectacular, but it is not the best eclipse. It's not at all like what we hope to see today. How many have seen a partial solar eclipse? Okay. Yeah. Pretty, isn't it? How many have seen an annular solar eclipse? I haven't. How many have seen a total solar eclipse? You in the front row, you've seen it. And I think you may be the only one. Where was it, sir? 1979 in which part of Canada? In Manitoba. Okay. Well, I'm excited about seeing something that is truly one of the wonders of our solar system. Now, all of these celestial shadows that we're going to consider today have three things. They have a source of light. They have an object that blocks part of that light. And they also have a screen. And the screen can be of a wall. And the bottom screen is showing you what my wife and I did in graduate school. This was our Saturday night entertainment. But the screen could also be a planet, or the moon, or the retina of your eyes. And today you're going to see probably a screen on the retina of your eye. Now, what are the cast of characters that are playing the shadow experience in the solar system. Well, as you can see, one of them is the sun, always the source of light, the earth and the moon. And they trade roles at times. One becomes the blocker of light and the other becomes the screen and then vice versa. So we're going to look at what kinds of eclipses we can have. And here are the two major ones we're going to look at. One is the lunar eclipse. And you can see the actual lineup is, of course, the sun, always the shining light. And then the Earth, in this case, which has a big dark region behind it, the big shadow. And that's called the umbra where no light from the sun reaches. And then a penumbra where some of the light does reach. 
So if you look at that, and you can see that it's a rather large shadow, and a lunar eclipse can be seen by anybody on the nighttime side of the Earth. Compare that then to a solar eclipse. In this case, the moon provides the shadow, and the shadow is very small in the umbra that it has. It does have a penumbra, just like the other uh, eclipse, but we tend to just see the total solar eclipse when we are looking at the sun. Right, the, <coughs> excuse me, the photo right next to the earth there shows the typical uh, shadow that the moon will have on the Earth's surface. And if you look carefully, you can see the umbra, the dark part of the center, and then the penumbra. The umbra is about 100 kilometers in diameter, but the penumbra, excuse me, the penumbra, is much wider. And that will be the start of our eclipse, the start of the eclipse. Well, the Earth and the Sun, or Earth and the Moon, rather, are special in our solar system. And one of the things that makes it special is that the Earth is the only planet which has a single large moon. And that single large moon does lots of things to uh, essentially influence what happens on Earth. Now, how did this come about? That's the real question. How? How did this come about? If you remember back in the Apollo days, and none of you probably do, the Apollo astronauts brought back rocks, and those moon rocks were analyzed, and what they found was they were identical to Earth rocks. And that was a puzzle. Well, this means that the Earth and the moon had a common origin. So, it turns out that this is about four point, I, wait a minute, yeah, four point, point, five billion years ago, the young Earth was hot, molten for the most part, and there was another planet that rammed into it. That planet is called, by the scientists, Thea. And Thea means something in Greek. I don't know what it is. But they collided, and out of that came a new Earth and the new moon. So if you will, Start that video right now. You can turn up the volume if you like. Here is, here is, whoo! Here is the, oh, I, yeah. Here is, sorry, I, I can't hear. There is Thea ramming into the proto-Earth, giving a lot of debris, and out of the debris are formed the moon and the Earth. And they were still hot bodies, but 
Out of the debris that was scooped up by either one, they then formed a very tight, close-knit uh, arrangement where the orbit of the moon was very, very small. And as we were on the hot surface of the moon, or the Earth rather, this would be what we would see as a moonrise. Eventually it cooled off until there was a bombardment of asteroids which produced the craters on the moon. Well, the Earth and the moon act very strongly and they provide tidal forces on each other, which are gravitational forces that disturb and distort the surfaces of each body. Two things happen, well many more than just two, but the two that we can look at today are, first of all, as the tidal forces move, they create energy which is lost, and that energy is translated to the Earth and Moon becoming farther and farther apart. Actually, the Moon and the Earth recede from one another about one and a half inches per year. Then it, it also slows down the Earth's rotation so that the number of days in the hour, uh, number of hours in a day, excuse me, uh, lengthens. So if many of you are having trouble getting things done in the 24 hours of our present day, uh, just wait. Uh, maybe 100 million years or so, and you'll have 25 hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> many times physics humor is not appreciated. <laughs> My wife can attest. <laughs> well, right now I know you're all thinking, <clears throat> Dr. Palmer, what in the world, how can we have, if we have a circular orbit like that, how can we have both a total eclipse of the sun or an annular eclipse of the sun. How many were thinking just that? Oh boy. Well, to make a, an experiment, I want everybody to try this experiment. And that is, everybody has a thumb, or if you don't, use a finger. <laughs> Be careful which finger. And I want you to try with your finger, moving it back and forth, to see if you can simulate, first of all, the total eclipse, and then an annular eclipse. So, everybody, arms out. Okay. Yeah. Class, let's settle down. <laughs> All right, what was important in going from the total eclipse to the annular eclipse? What did you have to do with your thumb? Anyone? Did you have to put it farther apart? Okay. That's the answer in case you didn't do that. Well, this is why I lied a little bit to you. The actual orbit of a moon around the Earth is not circular, it's an ellipse. And if you have an ellipse, then you're farther at some times, that's at the apogee, and then closer at other times at the perigee. 
And guess which one you see? At the apogee, you can see an annular eclipse, but at the perigee, you can see a total eclipse. Now, there is a sad thing to note here. In about 600 million years from now, <laughs> in about 600 million years from now, there will be no more total eclipses, which we hope to experience today, because the moon will have gone too far away from the Earth. Well, let's look at some facts about the solar eclipse. This is more physics humor, and, <laughs> and you are waiting for me never to do it again, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you. You got an A. If you look, if you look, you can see one of the things that we look at, notice about the moon's shadow is that it moves from west to east. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. The moon moves faster, about over twice as fast as the Earth does in its rotation about its polar axis. And so if that's the case, then it's like, oh, let's say, you're driving at uh, 50 miles per hour on I-70, and a car passes you going mm, 100 miles per hour, and uh, you see that other car go away from you. And it goes away at 50 miles an hour relative to you. Well, that's the analogy. That's the best one I can think of. But if you have others, let me know. During totality, strange things can happen. Animals do strange things, and humans can do strange things. So watch out. <laughs> the very famous 1919 total solar eclipse is famous to us physicists because that was the time that we found starlight to be bent by the Earth, or I'm sorry, the Sun. And that proved Einstein's relativity theory. Well, let's look at the total solar eclipse path today. And when I first was searching for one of these maps, I wanted to have one that showed Fulton, Missouri on it. Do you know there are no maps this large that, have, that we're showing Fulton, Missouri? <laughs> so I put that one in myself. Can everybody see where it is? And the arrow ends up being very close to where the maximum amount of totality time will be. In fact, we're only 30 or 8 seconds smaller or less time. So that was what I wanted to show with this. But you can see it goes all the way from Oregon all the way down through Georgia. Now, or South Carolina, one of those. I can't remember. Anyway, I want you to appreciate that Fulton isn't always recognized for what it is. The center of the universe. <laughs> and I was disgusted even with this slide, so I folded it in paper plane and uh, flew it off. 
There are three very, very prominent and very beautiful things to experience near and at totality. And those three are listed there. Uh, diamond ring, Bailey's beads, and the corona. So let's look first at the diamond ring. The diamond ring is not a good time to take off your glasses. Do not do that. If I catch any of you doing that, I'll yell at you. <laughs> okay. Um, the <laughs> and it should appear much like a diamond ring is supposed to appear. The next thing are Bailey's beads. Bailey's beads come about because light gets through some of the valleys of the mountain ranges that are at the rim of the moon. And that will be just before totality. And then at totality, you will see the corona. The sun's corona is very hot, much hotter than the surface of the sun. It's in the millions, tens of millions, tens of millions of degrees Celsius. And so one of the things we wonder about is why is it so hot? I'm not going to tell you, because I'm, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay, I'll tell you. It's really because the magnetic fields of the uh, sun are very, very, very strong and create some kind of confusion and give off a lot of energy, and that energy is given off as light. And it, uh, the heated gases. Well, let's just look briefly at viewing the eclipse safely. Everybody, do you see that? Everyone has his or her glasses on. Now, this must have been a very strict school that these people were in. But please don't, don't use your glasses. All right. Tips, 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 tips. Please use the NASA approved glasses. They should have no parts that have pinholes or scratches. They should also not be chewed on, or licked on, or any otherwise defiled. If you have chewed on your glasses, please throw those away and get some of the ones we're going to pass out, OK? Turn away. Turn away from the sun when you're putting on or taking them off. Everybody got that? All right. It makes you look like a dork, but they're very necessary. Very necessary, except for one time. And we'll look at that. Next slide. Do you see the one time you can take off your glasses? Only during the two minutes or so of total eclipse, all right? Only during that time can you take those glasses off and look at the corona, and you can't do it at any other time. The corona is often not seen unless you do take off your glasses at that time. But if there are any Bailey's beads or diamonds, please don't take off your glasses and look at it. Be safe. 
Okay. Now, this, if you didn't use glasses or want to use glasses, you may also use this pinhole projection onto some sort of screen. I have done that and it works very well. You can see partial eclipses very easily this way, but you can also see the totality when it occurs as well. That's the safest way to view what we're hoping to see today. All right, now I'm going to ask for questions. If they are easy, I'll answer them. If they're hard, Dr. Criswell will answer them. So if there are any questions, please ask me now. That'd be great. She asked, do you see a partial eclipse before or after, or the day before or the day after? And the answer is no, because you're seeing the exact coincidence of two orbital tracks. And those orbital tracks have to do with where the, where the moon is and where the sun is compared to us on Earth. So there is only one time when that coincidence happens. And it's very, very, uh, very rare that it will happen here. Does that help? All right. Oh, uh, how bright will the sun appear when, it, when you look through the glasses at it? Is that your question? You, you may keep your glasses on if you can possibly fit your uh, eclipsed glasses over them. Yeah. And it can, it can magnify, that is, it can focus sun's rays on your retina. Is that your question? And you don't want that to ever happen. So you can have a little bit of light, which gets through those glasses, but you cannot have your glasses off. By the way, no sunglasses are safe either. Does that help? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Oh, do you want to go back to the next, last, next, last slide? It depends on how far away the screen is from the hole. The bigger the distance, the bigger the image. The real problem with that is that sometimes the image gets very dim. So I would keep the uh, image close. Any other? 
One more question. Doctor, the next time, uh, I believe there will be a, a total eclipse will be visible in the United States in 2024. Yes. Between now and that time, will there be a total eclipse visible in any other part of the world? The answer is yes. There are approximately one to two total eclipses that appear per year. But they are very small. And so not many people see any solar eclipse, total solar eclipse. Well, I thank you so much. We're going to... Well, thank you. We're leaving you with a schedule. We'll leave this up as long as anybody's here to look at it. And have a great day on this great day. Thank you.